Welcome to the Healthy, Wealthy, and Smart Podcast. Each week, we interview the best and brightest in physical therapy, wellness, and entrepreneurship. We give you cutting-edge information you need to live your best life, healthy, wealthy, and smart. The information in this podcast is for entertainment purposes only and should not be used as personalized medical advice. And now, here's your host, Dr. Karen Litzy. Hey everybody, welcome back to the podcast and in this episode it is time for this month's mini masterclass. If you missed last month's masterclass, it was with Tom Goom where we spoke all about gluteal tendinopathy, so if you missed it, go back and check it out. In today's episode, I have the pleasure of speaking with Martin Asker. Martin is a sports medicine therapist specialized in shoulders and biomechanics. He has worked with different elite European handball teams since 2000 and for the last 12 years with a special focus on youth and adolescent elite players. He works part-time as clinical lead at a multidisciplinary sports medicine clinic in Stockholm, Sweden, mainly seeing shoulder-related problems and part-time as a PhD candidate at the Musculoskeletal and Sports Injury Epidemiology Center at Karolinska Institute in Stockholm. The overall aim of his PhD project is to deepen the knowledge in shoulder function in elite adolescent handball players, and the specific aim is to investigate risk factors for and prevention of shoulder injuries in such population. He has also has a special interest in throwing biomechanics and its relationship to throwing performance and injuries. He is also a board member of the Medical Committee of the Swedish Handball Federation and part of the medical team of the Swedish, Swedish Youth 16 National Handball Team. So, not surprisingly, today's mini masterclass is about overhead injuries in adolescent handball. Now, I know if you're listening in the United States, handball is not that popular of a sport, But this can translate into any overhead throwing athlete. So we talk about a specific case study. We go through the subjective, the objective, and a treatment plan. So hopefully you're going to get a lot of information that you can take with you to your own overhead throwing patient population. Thanks again to Martin for this great episode. Hey, Martin, welcome to the podcast. I'm so happy to have you on. Thank you, Karen. Uh, Thank you for having me. My pleasure. Of of course. And just for a little point of reference for people. So Martin and I met in Copenhagen back at the end of January, beginning of February. And, but before that you had met my friend, Sarah Hay. Yeah. In Chicago, right? Yeah. I met Sarah at the conference in, in Chicago. I think it was 2016. Uh, yeah. So I, uh, uh, I was uh, at a conference in Chicago, and and I, I met actually met Sarah on Twitter, uh, as many others, mm-hmm. and then I met her in real life uh, in Chicago in 2016. Yes, and then and then I got the opportunity to meet you at, at Copenhagen. Yes, because yeah. Sarah, like on the way there, she's like, "Well, you have to meet my friend Martin. You have to meet my friend. Um, it was you and Adam? Sarah. Yeah, yeah." yeah. yeah. And I was like, okay already, geez. No, I'm just joking. And then we met and we spent a couple of days with intense learning in Copenhagen. And here we are. Yeah. Here we are. And just so people know, because you can't see it, but it is happening that I am actually drinking like a full beer. Yeah, full not size, a little, normal size beer. It is a normal size, not small, tiny size Christian Barton beer. No. It is an actual real can of beer. So um, today what we're going to be doing is a little bit of a mini master class. So, but before we get into that, what I would love to know is where did your interest in overhead injuries and in handball come about that led you to your PhD and where you are now? Yeah, for sure. Uh, I'm from Sweden and we grew up in uh, in the 80s and the 90s where, where Sweden was really, really good at at handball like we pretty much won everything that we every competition uh so even though i haven't played handball i played ice hockey when i was young uh i i really really enjoyed handball from when i was really really little from being a little kid so uh when i started my career as a a massage therapist one of my friends played handball and uh, he asked me if i want to join and be part of the medical team so I think that's yeah, time, time flies. It was 20 years ago, 
Uh, so I started off working with Hamble players. And the good thing with Hamble uh, is that they get injured uh, <laughs> from our point of view. So they get injured from, from, from the head and, and down, so like pretty much every part of the body. And uh, many of them had the shoulder problems. And it's really, really, it was really tricky uh, because they kept throwing. And like if they busted the knee, we, we knew pretty much what to do and what not to do. But with the shoulder, it was really, really struggling. It still is. Uh, so I, I came to this crossroad like either I just give up on shoulders and, and focus on something else, or I just bite the apple and, and really dig into it. So from like an early early stage of my career, I I tended to to uh, go down that path, just focusing more and more on shoulders. And then then uh, about five years ago, I got this opportunity to to do my PhD. So I set up this this plan because I've been working a lot with with the adolescent players. So I had this this project in my head, uh, evaluating and uh, investigating risk factors for for shoulder problems because. Like my clinical experience was once you get it, it's you're pretty much stuck with it, especially in that age. Uh, so really trying to see how we can prevent it. So that's how it, how it all started. And luckily I got the, the Swedish Sample Federation on board and, and Karolinska Institute where I do my PhD now. And I have some really good supervisors believe in me. Uh, and then I started my PhD. So hopefully within one year, I, I will finish it. That's awesome. And, you know, we were talking a little bit before we went on the air about how kind of violent a game handball is. Because in the United States, handball is admittedly not that huge of a sport. Um, but you said it was kind of a combination between rugby and baseball. Because people yeah. are, like, you can push people and knock people over. And, and it just seems like it's a much more physical game than I thought it was going to be. So I can understand when you said they're always getting injured. I get it. Yeah, it's it's a it's a really really physical game. Uh, so I had that combination of of like a rough game. So you get hit and tackled a lot, and on top of that, you do a lot a lot of throwing. So you do like thousand and thousand of throws each each season, uh, and that combination can be be quite rough on the body. Yeah, I would think it yeah. would be. Yeah. Um, okay, so let's get to our sort of little uh, mini master class in our. Uh, case study. So Martin had sent this to me ahead of time. So I'm just going to read the very beginning of the case study and then we will go through how Martin would look at things objectively, uh, subjectively, objectively, and then maybe some treatment options. So here is the case study. It's a 13 year old girl who presented with shoulder pain of approximately two month duration. More comprehensive questioning revealed that the subtle pain began five months ago during the spring season and gradually increased with more substantial problems during a summer camp in August. Since August, she tried to keep playing, but the pain got worse and worse. Now she can't throw anymore. Her pain is located posteriorly of the shoulder during the cocking phase. No trauma to the shoulder except what comes with handball, which we just talked about. She did not seek care until now and tried to push on because there were tryouts for the regional team and she wanted to impress the new coach. She is a backcourt player, tall for her age and throws hard for her age. According to herself, confirmed by the parents, she reaches the sleeping and nutrition recommendations and she is healthy otherwise. Okay, so that's, that's our girl. So yeah. she comes in to see you. What are you looking at from a subjective point of view? What are you asking to get more information? Yeah, so to start with, this is, unfortunately, this is not an uncommon case. This is, I think this is the majority of all the players that are seeking my, uh, to our clinic uh, have a typical history like this. So it, it takes off sometimes a couple of months before, and then it's actually like uh, graduate more and more and more. And, eventually they can't throw anymore and that's when they come see you because they don't see you when when they're when they're pain they see you when they can't perform anymore so what i try to dig into is is a little bit more uh how did it start like she she denies any any trauma uh which is 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 good it's probably an overuse use problem that we see and what we're trying to do is like see how how 
what what have you done? What have, have I the first person you see? Have you seen anyone else? Uh, and most of them haven't seen anyone. They ask their coach or or what to do, but more or less they often just become an on and off player. So they play and play and play, and then they can't grow anymore, and they rest for a couple of days, and then they're back on the court, and then they rest for a couple of days, and then back on the court, and eventually that that strategy won't do it. Uh, and then they then come seek us. So, uh, pretty much, it's, it's pretty much the, the same. What I would try to do is, is because the major two things that, that happens when they're pro, either you have pain when they're releasable during the deceleration phase, or they have pain during the cocking phase. So when, they, when they're trying to, to you know, start a throwing motion. And it's often start with just deceleration pain. And in that case, it's they still can pro hard. They can pro quite accurate. Uh, and it's not until they get pain during the cocking phase when they feel like that dead arm, when they don't have the strength anymore, like the, the brain just say, no, we shouldn't pro anymore. Mm -hmm. And so it's not a neurological problem. It's, it's very rare that we see a neurological problem in these young throwers. Uh, it exists, but it's, it's not that common mm -hmm. uh, to my experience. So just that two question when does it hurt uh, and in the beginning if it's if it's just two months and it's the first first uh, occurrence of shoulder problems it's quite easy for them to to explain uh, and the other thing is where does it hurt if it's up top of the shoulders and front of the shoulder and back in the shoulder and, and many times you see in these young young throwers they get shoulder pain in the back of the shoulder uh, during the cocking phase, where we see the what we call the, the uh, posterior impingement or internal impingement, so that's what I'm trying to figure out in the in the in the history as well. And the other thing is, I wanted to to just draw or or explain a typical week. What are your training loads? How much training do you do? How many games do you play? Uh, how long are you are your practices? Uh, and what what do you do in terms of strength and conditioning? How much of the 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 of your training week is on the court? How much is is uh, throwing? She's this in this case she's a backcourt player, so it's probably a lot a lot of throwing, both on the games, but especially during the the training sessions. And also, I want her to to try to show me how like the season looks like. What do you do during the summer? Because normally these kids and, and also the, the the senior players they they like they're 100 percent handball for 10 months and then we have off season during the summer break especially in the young ones they have a summer break and then there's very little handball especially throwing um, because in, in the handball you from from a certain age we use wax or glue to to grip the ball and it's very hard to do that like if you're not on the on the court so so it's hard to bring your ball you go into greece for two weeks mm -hmm. bring in the ball with, with the glue and find a place to throw so so they reduce their throwing load for quite a long time and then like in this case she has this, this uh, summer camp so one week of throwing two practices per day and then you really spike them below so i, I really wanted because i i pretty much know what's going on in my experience like i would be very surprised if i see something else than, than what most of them do but it's also important for them to see when they draw a, uh, uh, when they when they like write down everything they do for a week or for months it's like it's, something happens in the head especially in the parents like oh uh oh oh, yeah. oh, oh wow i haven't thought of this like what are you doing here so nothing 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 and then you have one week with like 20 hours of, of practice what, what yeah. would you think would happen yeah, it's a problem. Yeah. That's yeah. and that goes with that chronic to uh, the yeah. acute to chronic workload ratio. And I think, yeah. do you when you're with them, will you like sort of draw that out on a graph and yeah. kind of show them yeah. visually? I'm sure that's really helpful. Yeah, yeah. So so we draw that like just like a staple diagrams or or just I just have to feel so so you can see for a week what happened, but especially like during the months and like in most cases from may to september like yeah. what's going on here you have two yeah. weeks of that. and 
And when you explain it, the first thing that pops up, especially when you talk to coaches, like, no, but we can't reduce the training here because this is very important. Now, I don't talk about reducing practice. I, I'm talking about increases. You can't stop. You can't, like, you can, you can take it easy, but you can't stop for three weeks and then right. expect you to go back to where you were before. Absolutely. And, and yeah. that can be difficult, I'm sure, for, like, a teenager. Yes. You know, yeah. so, so at this point, what is the hypothesis you have in your head? about yeah, this that, particular girl. Yeah, in this case, it's, it's, she, has, she has no trauma to the shoulder. So I don't expect that we will see any, any significant injury in the, in the shoulder, like a slap lesion or bank lesion, any, any injury like that. Uh, it's more like a, a flare-up in the tendinopathy. So I have a tendinitis, like a sore rotator cuff. That's, that's the first thing that happens. And then... That makes an, that takes an expression when you're when you're throwing and it's painful in the deceleration phase. And what happens with the pain is that you probably will will change your motor control. So you will be be what do we call motor control? If you, if you just call it your your throwing capacity or your shoulder capacity, that would that will decrease. So eventually, you will drive into to ending up with several other problems. And the end station of that is, for many of the cases in this age, is the posterior impingement. So eventually it will be painful when you start throwing and then you will have no performance. And uh, it, so let's say for this girl, she's got pain sort of in the cocking phase. Does that pain, will you see that carry over into deceleration as well? Is it just sort of the whole movement then becomes painful? Yeah, eventually the whole movement will become painful and she will get... Like we recall eventually, but we mainly see that in the in the older adolescent players and the senior players. Eventually, she will get obviously a normal impingement or subacromial pain because everything gets so sore around the shoulders. She gets bursitis, like it just adds on. And and then you have a player on the, on the other side. This the 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 diagnosis here. If you look at the specific diagnosis, it's like like an overused shoulder to just saying stop but after a couple of years you will find a lot a lot of things in that shoulder so mm -hmm. pretty much everything you can from the textbook uh, because she just kept on and added on another thing another thing and then we'll see a, like a, a slap tears coming up grade one and then grade two and then pretty much everything you can can see in the shoulder yeah, and, then, and, and this is kind of that. I'm going to just take a couple of days off. I'm going to not throw, and then I'm going to go back, and then it's going to be yeah. painful. And then it's just rinse and repeat throughout the years, yeah. which I'm sure yeah. some, some athletes certainly do that. Yeah, yeah. She had pain for five months. That's actually like It's a quite long short. time. Yeah, it's a long time. It's a long time. But, but, yeah, it's a long time. But, but on average, in our clinic, they have pain for seven and a half months before they come, come seeking us. Yeah. So she's an early, what we call like an early medical care seeker. Mm -hmm. uh, unfortunately, like, because we, we have this culture in, in certain sports. Like in handball, it's like your mother and father play handball, they had a sore shoulder. Your, your coach had a sore shoulder, like half your teammates have a sore shoulder. So, so it's like, nah, it comes with a game. So at some, to some, some extent, it comes to the game. But if you can't throw anymore, that's, that's just beyond. That's not part of the game. Right. And then how does your education then go uh, with this player, with the parents, and then with the coaches? So you've got all this information. You have a pretty good idea of what's going on before you even do any evaluative procedures, any hands-on procedures. But let's say she's there with her parents or with a coach. I mean, I would just, how does that education start? And does it start at this point? Yeah, I think it's, it's, it has to start early because if you have the first session, uh, most of the time uh, is spending on like, in this case, you get a pretty short picture of, of what's going on and, and quite sure, even before we do any objective uh, assessment of the shoulder, I'm pretty sure what, what's going on. So it's, it starts very early from, from just when, when she uh, explained how the weeks look like or the months look like. That's, that's just her starting thinking of that. And, and the parents sit right beside her and like, okay, yeah, it's much, it's not. And then I can fill in like, you doing, what you're doing, your ratio between a game and, and practice is, is quite screwed. 
Like it's, it's, you should do a lot, a lot more training in your age uh, instead of, of matches. And, and the other thing is, is, uh, what, what it's, what I often do with the, with the, uh, with the player and the, and the parent, because she's a teenage and, and she's really good at sports and loves her sports. So she has just pretty much one thing in her head. Just, I want to play handball. Exactly. Uh, yeah. And, and the parents love it because they have a happy teenager. It doesn't just bang the door and, and, and trashes the, in the house with parties. Perhaps she do that as well, but, but they just happen that she's happy and she's really good at something. Uh, so what I'm trying to tell them is like, but how good are you now? So you, if you put it on your court now, uh, how good are you? I can't throw now. So you, you like, you, you, I'm better than you in handball right now. Mm-hmm. So what you've been doing now hasn't been working, has it? No. So we have to convince them like being an on-off, on-off player, it, it won't do anymore. Like that you have to skip that strategy. You have to do something else. So just shifting that mind that that is not the right thing to do because mm-hmm. you, can, you can talk to them for an hour or two hours and like this is the plan. And then the next thing, like the, the last thing they say before they walk out the door is like, okay, I have this game coming up on Sunday. Can I play? And just spend two hours explaining that like we probably have two months where we're going to do like this and this and this. And like, okay, good, good. I have the exercises. Perfect. Uh, can I play next week? So that's that's just the thing that I have on the mind. So that's yeah. the tricky part with this with this play. It's not the tricky part is not like finding an exact structure that's that's causing her pain or whatever. It's like shifting that her her focus. Like you have to be shoulder smart. This is your this is like this is your weapon. This is what you, what you have to really really take care of. You have to be really shoulder smart. If you can't throw. Then you're just like there's nothing else. There's no plan B. Like you can't just stand there. This is not yeah. a sport where you can't throw. So, so just shifting that, and also because she's 13 years old, she has like at least 15, 20 years of a career ahead of her. But when you're 13 years old, you 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 plan like half a day. Well, everything's the end of the world when you're 13. Yes. Yes. So there's a huge psychological component here and being yeah. able to mitigate that for a 13 year old is one thing and having to do that for the parents is another thing. So as the treating therapist, you've really got a whole family that you need to take care of yeah. and it, it's difficult. Yeah, absolutely. Because as I said, she has one, one thing in her mind. It's like, I want to play handball. I want to be the best handball player in the world. And she already told us like, she wants she pushed on because she has this like triads coming out, new coach who wants to press. So all these are the like the triggers that will, will take her down the wrong path. So we have to figure that out as well. If we don't do that, she's gonna just sit there and nod and nod, okay, okay, and then she will go home and just go back to, to her normal track. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So in, in this case, you have to I, I try to talk with the coaches as as much as possible. I just give me the number to the coach and I would call him because we know that what I say to the patients and if the patient tried to repeat that or tell someone else, it could be, yeah. Yeah. We've all played the game of telephone as, as a teenager. Yeah. Yeah. It doesn't work. Yeah. And also depending on the coach being 13 years old and, and coming back to the coach, they are, they said two months and the coach get disappointed. And, if it's a really bad coach, it takes it out on the player. So, so to to prepare the, to um, to help the players deal with that, uh, it's a good thing to talk with the coach. Like we have this player in your team, uh, as you know, she can't throw anymore. Uh, she has a whole career in front of her. She's really talented. Give us two months, and we can work with her, and she will be back um, as good as possible. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, and that's that's hard. That's really yeah. hard. But I think yeah, I think it it's important that everyone knows that when you're treating an athlete, especially a young athlete like this, that it's you're educating more than just the patient, and that it's really a a um, a wide circle of people that need to be involved. And as the treating therapist, you have to be the one to reach out to those people. Yeah, so, yeah, for sure. Yeah. So, what are you looking at in this patient? from an objective standpoint? 
Um, yeah, so we, with this patient from history, uh, what found out there, we're probably not going to see any major pathology in, in her shoulder, uh, as we said before. But we start with just a quick inspection uh, to the player, and without reading too much into what we're seeing, what we need to recognize is in these players, we often see side to side differences. They often have a more rounded shoulder on their dominant side, the different scapular position and, and so on. So the inspection is more to see if we see any major differences within the, in the shoulders. And we mainly see that in the, in the traumatic shoulder, not in the, the overuse shoulder as we have in front of us. So don't tend to read too much into to that and then move on to, to active and passive range of motion. Uh, see if she, she has the ability to go into that, that end range of motion, it's very important for throwing. And also is that is painful? Is it pain that limits the, the range of motion or is it more lack of range of motion due to like muscle tension or, or tightness of, of the shoulder? Uh, and also then we do resistant movements. So isometric and, or uh, eccentric strength measurements. Uh, see if that is uh, provoking any pain, testing it in neutral position and also in her, her throwing position. If it's not too, too painful. Trying to detect if you see any side to side weaknesses, um, especially in the dominant side where, where she has a problem in that case. So those are the main main things and then also do your uh, thorough palpation throughout the shoulder so palpating the, the bicep tendon the ac joint you're probably not going to find anything in the ac joint we often see that in the junk area as a, as a traumatic uh, injury when we see ac joint problems uh, so palpating the cuff all the way around the back of the shoulder where, where she has described her her pain um, but as I said, in, in her case, we're probably not going to find a specific structure. So what would be interesting to test if she has any underlying instability in the shoulder. So we're doing the apprehension test. In this case, uh, it's not necessary that she feels uncomfortable because she feels like her, her shoulder is popping out. It's more that we're provoking her pain in the, in the back of the shoulder. And trying to do that apprehension test in various positions of the shoulder, not just a 90-90 position going from. Instead, we're going from like four to five degrees of abduction up all the way to 180 degrees because they're not throwing in the 90-90 position, they're throwing with a little bit more mm -hmm. abduction in the yeah. shoulder. That makes yeah. sense. Yeah. And now when, um, you're, when you're measuring um, strength, what are you yeah. using to measure strength? Are you just going by your feel or using a dynamometer? What are you using there? If, if, she's, if she's very sore in the shoulder and it's very painful, uh, it, I would say it's not necessary to, do a, uh, to use the dynamometer because the, the numbers that we're going to get out of the, the machine is not going to tell her axial strength or not. So then just, just doing resistant uh, movements with my hand. But if she's not that painful, and especially when she's in, in the neutral position, the zero, zero position, just external internal rotation with her arm on the side, uh, that's often less painful. And then I use the, the dynamometer so I can get a like, really good objective measure of her, her shoulder strength. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's really useful in the, in the clinic uh, to have a, a dynamometer to use. Uh, but just telling if someone is, is, is very weak in the shoulder, you can probably do that just, just with your hands. But Got to it. get a good objective measure, uh, we use the dynamometer. Okay. In case. All right. Good. Uh, and other specific tests like testing for, for slap lesion or biceps tenopathy, uh, it's, we, as I said, we're probably not going to find anything here she hasn't had any trauma she doesn't describe any clicking or deep pain in her shoulder or, or uh, pain when she's she's lifting or doing doing biceps curls stuff like that so we're probably not going to find anything there uh, so i would say it's not that necessary to do all the, the tests that you have in your batteries for from this this patient mm -hmm. if she doesn't have an underlying instability uh, I would say it was probably not necessary that we're going to find anything like a slap tear or 
or biceps tendinopathy. Uh, definitely going to see any uh, calf rupture in this age. is too young for that. Uh, but it's more, as I said, like that internal posterior impingement uh, when she's in the cocking phase. So that's what we're trying to provoke. Uh, and we're doing that with the apprehension test. And then she says, like, yeah, this is actually what, what I feel when I'm throwing. It's mm-hmm. the pain in the back. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So it, we're making sure to to different that to uh, instability when she describes like, oh, I don't want you to go any further because it feels like my, my shoulder is going to pop out. It feels like I'm, I don't want you to do that because mm-hmm. that's a whole different patient because then we have a, a shoulder instability and we have to figure out, think about that when it comes to rehab because mm-hmm. it's two different patients. Yeah. Right. Right. So you're kind yeah. of doing the same test, but you're looking for, so you're doing the apprehension test, which could tell you two yeah. different things. It could tell you yeah. if there's that instability, the anterior instability, or if there is some sort of posterior impingement. So it's important to ask the patient when she says, oh, don't go any further. Why? Is that correct? Yeah, exactly. Exactly. That's exactly the thing. And because, and yeah, we have to difference those because you can have a, a posterior uh, impingement uh, because of an underlying instability that's causing mm-hmm. that. But just having the posterior instability not necessarily means that you have uh, an instability. Got it. Yeah. So you could be have posterior impingement with or without an underlying instability. Got it. Yeah. Got it. So, so we have to difference those, those two because there are two different patients of to course. begin with when, when yeah. we start in the rehabilitation. Great. So, so anything else that you're looking at from an objective standpoint? I used to do a lot of measuring with passive or, or active, like seated rotation or extension of the, of the uh, thoracic spine. Mm-hmm. But like w- what we've done in, in my PhD project, and we see in other studies as well, that what we measure on the bench, uh, it doesn't correlate to what happens when you're throwing. Because when you're throwing at maximum speed, like for range of motion in the shoulder, it's, they come up to so much more range of motion mm-hmm. than what we measure. And the other thing is we don't actually know what we're measuring. So if you look at the shoulder, it's, is it muscle tension? Is it the, the humeral torsion? Is it a joint capsule? So we don't know that when we measure. So we have a measurement that are really, really ob- like good objective, really reliable, but it doesn't correlate to what happens in, in the real sports setting. So I tend to do that less and less, unless we see something really obvious. We're like, oh, you have a really, really decreased range of motion on that mm-hmm. side or in the shoulder or in the thoracic or in the trunk or thoracic spine. But otherwise, I mainly look at get a picture of what, how do you throw, uh, and then you end up with the question like, is this something that we can or want to change, like your throwing technique? She is rather young, so in this case, we, we have a chance to, to, sh- to change that or adjust change, it. You can, you can change some habits there. Yeah, yeah. like yeah. try to throw with the light, your arm a little bit higher, trying, trying to work with your trunk a little bit more, etc. But we have a senior player, like on a professional level, and looking at them throwing, like they've been throwing like that for 15 years or something. Changing that, it's A, it's very hard, and B, it's probably just going to, it could be a little risky yeah for yeah. sure for sure so it's it's i tend to be more and more like okay this is how you throw you do a, like a really fast whip throw it's gonna put more demand on your shoulder so in that that case i know what 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 you're gonna do with your shoulder so we're gonna prepare you for that rather than changing your your biomechanical or technique like that's easier to do when you're really really young but in her case here, she's been throwing for six or seven years. Mm-hmm. So changing that, it, it takes time. And it's not necessarily better for her performance and not necessarily injury preventative. So I, I have that in mind, but I don't like measuring trunk. Okay, now we're measuring shoulder. Now we're measuring that. Rather, I, I watch them throw. And then I get a rough figure like, okay, this is how we throw. Is this something that we... Do I see something like really clear, like, okay, I, I want to change this or improve that? 
You're, you've got some clinical, are there any other clinical findings that you are really going to look at? How about, um, I, I don't know how common this is in Sweden, but in the, here in the U.S., like everybody gets an MRI or CAT scan yeah. or an x-ray. And are those, is that something that is very common? Is that something that if this girl came to you for the first time, would you recommend an MRI? No, it, it, it's quite common in, in Sweden as well. And, and uh, often they, they come and have an MRI because it's, it's especially in, in, in Stockholm, a capital city, it's quite easy to get one, especially if you're, if you're ready to pay for it for yourself. You can get in within a couple of days. Mm-hmm. Uh, but in these young players, without any trauma, nothing like I, I suspect anything like to be really, really damaged in the shoulder so i wouldn't send it to an mri if, unless i find something like in the in the like major loss of of function mm-hmm. but in her case if she stopped throwing like within two three days her shoulder works perfect until she like goes up and, and pros a lot again right but if it wouldn't like if you rest for three or four days your shoulder should go back to to like normal Mm-hmm. Uh, but if it doesn't like if you still have significant loss of function in your uh, like in your daily daily um, situations that is not include handballs mm-hmm. or if you have a significant trauma then then uh, an MRI or start with an, an, an ultrasound yeah so, it's definitely warranted okay are there yeah. any other objective things that you would look at before moving on to some possible therapeutic treatments I think that 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 covers m- most of it. Okay, so we've got our object, we've got our subjective, we've got our objective. What are you now thinking about on a potential treatment or plan of care? And obviously, we don't have to get super specific, but just so that people have an idea of, okay, this is this might be a cup, this might be a good plan to follow. Yeah. So in her case, it's it's I think it's three major things. It's to go through her like weekly schedule uh, and the main occasion like she's, she's a young talented girl uh, she throws hard she's just very very uh, attractive to the coaches uh, and it's not common that they play on several teams they play with the with the U14, the U14 team and then with the mm-hmm. with the one or two year older uh, teams so one of the things going through like she's in in her growth period, which she can really, really gain some strength and conditioning. Mm-hmm. And she uses like many of it, uh, I would say too much time on, on matches. So she's playing like three or four matches per week, which perhaps should be one or two at mm-hmm. most. And the other time would be just strength and conditioning in, in Hamilton, building that up like a physical uh, fitness. Because at some point later on in her career, she has to be really, really physical fit. And now is the period when she has a chance to, to build that up. Mm-hmm. Like she will play thousands of games like later on down the road. So many of these games, I would say it's not that important. Like she thinks it's very important. Her coach of course. Really important. yeah. But if you look at it, and that's also something that trying to get them to have a perspective. Like if your major goal is make it to the national team, then many of the games on their way down that road doesn't really matter that much. It will be like one of the 10 that will really, really matter. And, and trying to get them to, to figure it out. So that would be one of the things. The other thing mm-hmm. is just to, to rest the shoulder for a while. So we get that so that it, it calms down a bit. And, and then we're trying to, to build it up, especially and, build up this, the strength around the shoulder. Yeah, and sorry. when you say rest for a while, do you have a time period? I, I assume it's sort of patient dependent. Yeah. But when you say to them, I want you to rest for a little bit so that we can get back to playing, not yeah. this is indefinite, I'm sure. But yeah. what are sort of average... Like, let's say for this girl, given her history, five months of pain, really days where she can't throw it all, what would be the average rest period for a patient like this? I would say like rest from, from throwing or any, any 
heavy stuff on the on the shoulder. Mm -hmm. I say we rest for for seven to ten days. Okay. And then we come back and then we'll do new evaluation. It depends on, on how sore mm -hmm. she is on her first um, sure. first session. Yeah. Sure. But that's also is is if we say like you're gonna rest for two months because we could end up like no throwing for two months. But if I say that she comes in and she'll get like that throw in her face uh, because that's often not what, what they're expected. No, I've, I no. mean, I've said that to people and they've turned around and found a new therapist. Yeah. Yeah. That's, I think that's, if I look back, I think that's when I say that there's like, okay, I see you in a week and within two or three hours, like send an email or just cancel the, the online if you don't want to talk with you. Mm -hmm. So, I say like we rest for this and then we're going to do a new evaluation and and what we're going to do is that we're going to build up the shoulder capacity so i try to explain like the whole the whole plan and and i don't want them to rest from from throwing or rest from the handball game uh for a long period i want them to rest from like the 100 percent like the 90 to 100 percent heavy throws i want them to rest from from that that major rugby stuff that happens when someone grabs and pulls your arm. I want them to rest from that. Uh, and most of them are like, okay with that. Mm -hmm. the, the thing is like, they, they have this super important game that's coming up. So that's what we have to, to work with. Uh, but I, as long as you get them on board, like if it, if it takes two months or three months, like that's for, for them, it's a really long time, as we said. But if you can get them on board, like, you know what, you're going to have 15 years of career. And I'm pretty sure that you, you're going to gonna get through these two months because pretty much everyone that ended up in our national team has done that. Pretty mm. much every one of them have at least two months off during their adolescence for some reason, some injury. Mm -hmm. uh, and it worked out well anyway. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, being very reassuring, not being, not telling them no, 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 no. but just saying, no. listen, we want you to take a break from this aspect of the game, yeah. but you can do other aspects of it. Yeah. 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 Okay. Yeah. So, so, cause that's one of the major thing that we see that really, really demotivates them is if they get an injury and they can't be part of the team. Mm -hmm. So they feel, they feel like they put outside. Uh, and that's when they started doubt about themselves, started doubt about their coach ever going to see them again if they're like the, that's, that window of opportunity, that spot for the national youth team. It's all gone now. It's, it's never going to happen. So we really want them to just, just take that little thing away. So you, yeah. still, but you still need, you can't rest from handball and then come back after like six months and think that everything's going to be super good. Right, right. Yeah. Uh, and then we have these, this, uh, time to build up the shoulder capacity. And for many of them, especially these young ones, it's about shoulder and the kinetic chain strength. That's, that's what we're basically going to focus on. Essentially, there's nothing they have to heal in their shoulder. It's just things that have to calm down. So as soon as that happens, we can start, start doing that. We're going to do a lot, a lot of, of shoulder strengthening, uh, especially rotational strength and, and abduction strength. Uh, and in this case, depending on on uh, on how strong she is to begin with, how shall uh, how used she is to weightlifting, etc. We have to to see what what level she is she is on. But that we're going to focusing on, um, and especially the external rotation strength, and which which is really important to to throw its shoulder. Uh, and trying to to uh, go from quite easy stuff up to heavier and heavier stuff and especially doing strengthening in their full full range of motions full rotational range of motion uh, so going from full external rotation into full internal rotation and so how do you know when it's appropriate to move into those higher ranges of motion or more towards yeah. those end ranges. What, what do you use as a, a bar as measurement to say, okay, now we can move into some higher ranges. Yeah, it's a good question. What I'm trying to do, I don't want to provoke her pain. 
like the pain that she's describing when she's throwing, that's what we're trying to evoke. She could be tired in the shoulder, feel a soreness around the shoulder, well, the things that comes with, with strength training, but I don't want to, to describe that, yeah, that's my, my throwing pain, so to say. So that's, that's, the, that's, the, that's the thing that we're really, really trying to, to uh, avoid. So that's what, what's steering the whole, whole, whole strengthening position. So in many cases, it's okay for them to, to do quite heavy loads, just a couple of degrees be below. So they go into a little bit more of, of induction or don't external rotate that much. Uh, but I still want them to keep doing, keep going on to that motion, but perhaps we can't load them that much at this point. But I still want them to, to be in that potion, potion position because uh, I don't want them to get too, too stiff. So I want them to do the whole range of motion, but, mm -hmm. but we can't load them too much. So it's, it's the pain there their throwing pain so to say that's that's that we're looking for and then you're just sort of playing around with load as you move up through range of motion so you may be a little heavier in the lower range and as you move up go a little lighter until they're a little stronger and then a little heavier and then kind of keep seesawing back and forth between range of motion and load is that right yeah exactly that's that's perfect okay. to describe yeah okay so we exactly that what, what we're trying to do uh, and and it's also easy for them to to uh, to know what to do and what not to do. So that's the only thing that we're quite specific with. I don't want you to get your pain here. But try to work it work around. Uh, but we need them to to be eventually be in that position where they where they're throwing because that's that's where where they, they put the force on the shoulder. Of course, so they have the demand on the shoulder. So eventually they have to do really heavy loads at that position yeah uh, sleeper what, stretch is very I was, very popular. i was just gonna i was just gonna ask that i was like what do you think of the sleeper stretch i think it's it's what happens because we see we could see like in two or three weeks we see results that you increasing your your internal rotation uh, quite a lot but what we know now from from um, like the explanation of what happens when we stretch is if you get like that quick results it's probably just you're telling your brain that it's okay to go out to that mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. that range of motion and as i said before like we don't know exactly what's what's like decreasing or or what's what's causing the the lack of like the lack of rotation right and and the other thing is it doesn't correlate what happens when they're throwing so instead of having everybody doing passive stretching we we i i do a lot of strengthening in the end range of motion because you have to be stronger and, and uh, the side effect of that is you you gain range of motion mm -hmm. and like what are some examples of maybe an end range of motion rotation exercise that you might do yeah so i have them lying on the on the bench on their in the spine position so just going in external rotation with the dumbbell mm -hmm. uh, or with a kettlebell like that and eventually like going just full external rotation and extension you mm -hmm. know like that mm -hmm. and also doing the same thing when they get the, the strength to do it so we're doing a lot of, of eccentric in that that position and the same thing in the internal rotation so they have them in, in in the Hawkins Kennedy position if you call it like that and the same thing with the with the mm -hmm. dumbbell mm -hmm. and doing both concentric and eccentric strengthening in that position cool. but it it's, it's a few steps before you get there of course uh, yeah so you're not taking you mean you're not taking a heavy kettlebell and doing that right off the bat no no it's not because because and and we have players that try that and they come back and say this is the most idiotic <laughs> idiotic things i've ever done because it just made my my shoulders no i'm sore. super sore yeah yeah no yeah. super sore but it yeah it's, and I, I, when I teach these courses, and all these people come up like and say, "Ah, oh, this is how can you put him in that position with like, like it's twenty kilo dumbbell, like." But when you're throwing, it's a handball that weighs around four hundred uh, grams, and when you're throwing that with that speed, one hundred and twenty kilometers, the force on the shoulder is nothing compared to, uh, or what we're doing in the gym is nothing compared to mm -hmm. force when you're throwing. 
So, and that's what we have to prepare them for. So doing that with a 20 kilo dumbbell, it's pretty much like half of the force that is put on the shoulder when you're, when you're throwing. So it's still nothing near that. Yeah. So, yeah. So, and, yeah. And obviously you're not starting out with that weight. You might be starting out with a couple of pounds. Sorry, American. Yeah. I don't really, I'm not good with the grams yeah. and the kilos yeah. and all that, but you may be doing the same range of motion exercise or the same strengthening exercise in those end ranges motion, just with less weight. Yeah. yeah. And then progressing through to heavier weights. Yeah. So in this case with our, our 13 year old player, uh, she would probably just start with her arm as a weight and then move on to perhaps use the ball as a weight and uh, then eventually air a band and in the end use a small dumbbell or, or, or small kettlebell or weight ball. So that would fit perfectly, uh, more perfectly for her, uh, obviously not going up to the 20 kilo dumbbell. Right, right. Uh, so you're looking case. at a realistic progression based on the person in front of you. Yeah, exactly. And when she can do that, we started doing more more power exercises, so throwing a medicine ball or weight ball, uh -huh. and more plyometrics, so dropping and catching a, a sand ball or weight ball, and eventually going more and more into a throwing program. So I have a throwing program, and uh, it's eight steps. So a throwing program. So if you can do it for one week without any flare-ups, you can move on to the next step. So going from like doing 50% of, of your maximum pros and then go up to 60 and 70. And mm -hmm. the next week you do the first step as a warm up. If it's still feel fine, you go, go to the next step and you do that. And then eventually we do a return to throwing program. And I do that three times a week because if you do it once and they, and they clear it once, it could be just luck or they can just mm -hmm. be eating or, or mm -hmm. so, and then I come back. Uh, every second day and do it so one day of rest and the rest is is for the rest but also see if any flare-ups anything mm -hmm. happens mm -hmm. after the, the night and, and when you're doing that 50 percent, is that 50 percent of total throws or 50 percent of their capacity as far as you know you just said the amount of force that goes to the arm so is yeah. this 50 percent of total throws as in let's say they were i'm going to make this up instead of throwing 100 they're throwing 50 or is right, it the sorry, actual no. velocity of the arm? Yeah, the velocity. So we're trying okay. to do the, the, the same number. Mm -hmm. uh, and okay. because, because when you're throwing, you can, throw, you can throw pretty much, I would say you can throw 500 pro if it just passes. If mm -hmm. it just stands you, you, you your legs will get tired before your shoulder. Mm -hmm. But as soon as you get up to like 85, 90%, then when that's like the level when you put a lot, a lot of force on your shoulder. Got it. So we're okay. trying to, that's what we're trying to, to, um, to build up to. Got it. Do you, are you exercising everything aside from just the shoulder when they're in like a, a like a, a whole fitness type of thing? Yeah. yeah. So the, the other thing here is like in many of these cases, like, like this patient, she, she's been focusing too much on, on the matches. She hadn't had the time. She's really talented because she, she's, She's have a really, really. She's she's built for handball, and if she's also really tall, uh, then what we call it is a, she's a like pseudo talent. Like she's she's tall. That's not talent. It's just good parents, uh, and that makes her really good at handball. And if she's left-handed, then it's like then that's the jackpot because then you're tall. You, you have the like the motor skill, the humble brain, and you're left handed. That's then you make then you really, really wait. Unique. Why does why does left handed make a difference? Yeah, because when, when you're playing, so you have in humble, you have have six players, you have three backcourt players. Mm -hmm. uh, so you have the back wing, left wing, and, and right wing. So if you're right wing, you throw with your left to get a good, 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 uh, good window for the, for the goal. It's better to be left handed. Okay. Yeah. Okay. But only fifteen percent right. is, is left handed. So if you're left handed you're just really attractive. Got it. Got yeah. it. Okay. So what many of these young players do, they do they play a lot a lot of matches because that's that's the fun part of it. Sure. But eventually they have to have that physical fitness. So what we're trying to do is through these months how long it now will take to get it back to the throwing. We also have this opportunity to build up her handball fitness. We're trying to focus on that as much as possible. 
And we know that like 70% of withdrawing velocity comes from the lower limb. So we're trying to get the whole kinetic, kinetic chain. So we do a lot of medicine ball throwing when, when, when you get the shoulder strength for it. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, like trunk strength, trunk rotational strength. Uh, so it's not just focusing on, on, the, on the shoulder. What would you, if you were to give, you know, a bit of a summary about this particular player, given her mechanism of injury and what you found objectively and what you did as a treatment, what would a summary be? How would you summarize this patient for us? Yeah, as, as I started, it's, it's, it's not a new, this is, this is like the most common patient that I see in, in, in the young Hamble player. So she's been spiking her, her load, uh, especially during the summer season. When she's off season, so she stops throwing and then she's come back and start throwing. And, and she's had a little bit of problem before the summer. And uh, so it's, it's like gives you a hint that this is something that was just under the radar, just hadn't flared up anymore. Mm -hmm. And uh, the thing, as I said, the, the thing that we, we want to do is if we, it's, it's, you can make it really easy. Like the player often tells you what, what, what the mechanism, like she can pretty much like, I, I have a shoulder pain. It started when I, I did, whole week of throwing and the weeks before I went to Greece. So you just have to, okay, how can we fix it? But pretty much same thing going to happen next week. Are you going to Greece next summer? Yeah. Yeah. It was so fun. So I have to go back. Okay. Are you going to the summer camp? Yeah. That was also so fun. Okay. So that's what we have to work with. So in this case, what I do with many of the players is I have to do something during the summer. So you have to do a throwing program during the summer. You don't have to, to throw the hardest you can every day, but just, just keep the shoulder going. Just you don't rest it. Just keep it going, so it's so it's 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 quite ready for for what's to come. And also incorporate the parents into this because she's 13 years old. So the parents have to understand like this is this is now she's 13. You have a sore shoulder. It's not going to go away by itself. So you have to. Think about it. You don't. You don't have to stress. It's not the whole world. You don't have to go think about your shoulder for every second of the day. We don't want that. But we want it to be shoulder smart. So don't don't start throwing without any proper warm up. If you feel the shoulder is, is starting to get painful, it doesn't doesn't uh, it's still sore like after a week, even though you rest. Like okay, then then you have to do something about it. So it it's it's quite normal when you get it that you get it again during the next season at some point. Mm -hmm. So we just want them to get the, the keys or the, some, some things, some, some tools to be working with. So what, what will I do when this happens? When I start to feel something in my shoulder, okay, then I will stop doing the, the heavy throws for, for a couple of practices. And I, I will try to analyze what did I do wrong? And I would say most of the cases, what I do is like, I stop doing my, my shoulder routine. I felt so good. So, and in this age, like they're immortal. Mm -hmm. Like as soon as they don't have any pain, like uh, I'm immortal. So just giving them the tools, like this is really important that you do this. You have the opportunity to get, not just stay uh, shoulder healthy, but also gain performance. Mm -hmm. If you do this program, you will increase your show, throwing velocity for like 10, 15%. And that's really, really much. And that's, I think, the language that we have to talk with them, especially the player, but also the coaches. Like, they they care, but they care more about the performance than mm -hmm. injury prevention. Sure, sure. So, kind of reframing that from we're going to do this to prevent injury to we're going to do this so you become a better player, you become more yeah. explosive, you become stronger, you become yeah. more attractive as a player, yeah. Yeah. which is great. Yeah, yeah. because the, I think we we like we, sh we should never ever mention like prevention <laughs> it's it's because they, they don't know don't what's well, gonna go about, in like, one year and right out the other yeah yeah but if you say like do this then you're gonna throw harder and like oh wow okay that, that, that's really really cool because you can't talk about risk with someone like 13 or 15 or 16 mm -hmm. like that's all what they do every day long they take risks like they do idiotic things that's right. that's that's that that's their job. Right, that's their job right. When you're adolescent, like you already right. have no hormones, just 
you do you do if you think about the things you did when you were 16 like your first trip down to Ibiza or, or like whatever like it's, <laughs> first trip. It's, where I grew up in Pennsylvania I'm not going to Ibiza when I'm 16 I, I didn't I, I had a curfew at 10 o'clock. <laughs> oh, sorry, sorry. No, but it, I think you took some risks when you were when you were less. So if someone said, oh, you shouldn't do that, you shouldn't they're like, ah, oh, okay, whatever. They say, they just, <laughs> yeah, whatever, whatever. <laughs> so we have to turn that around. And, yeah. and uh, I said, like, the main thing with, with her, we, we don't see, if you summarize, we don't see any, any history where we suspect any major injury and and she pretty much told us what happens like she didn't get pushed she didn't land it on the shoulder in a specific angle she just spiked her load that's, mm -hmm. that's what she did and that's yeah. the most common thing and then we work backward like okay how how like the last months and then we're down to your week and how's your day Mm -hmm. That's what we ask about, like, how's your sleep, how's your nutrition, because she's in that age that's really, really important. And we know that now from some Swedish studies that mm -hmm. that is a specific risk factor. If you don't reach the, the recommendation of nutrition and, and sleep, you increase the risk of, of having a sports injury. So all those small details, everything that we can, can change. Mm -hmm. and in this case, we, I think we just have to focus on that instead of trying to focus on what specific specific structure in your shoulder is causing yeah. the pain or what specific if you can just change the angle of your throwing like no it's just calm the things down and this is how you throw okay now we're going to build up the capacity so you can throw in in the way you've been throwing for seven years as, as long as it's not just looks like oh this is this is not going to happen really but yeah. this is really problematic but again that's that's then we became really really subjective like we if you look right. at any sport we see people like how can you even run if you look like that? I know. And you like, see it all the time. And these yeah, are elite, yeah. elite, elite athletes. Yeah. There's no yeah. way you're going to change someone's running pattern if they've just run the New York City Marathon three times in a row. Like, it's crazy. Yeah. yeah. And in this case, we did, I didn't bring it up, but, but scapular dyskinesia is something that's been discussed for the past 20 years since, since the since the first paper came up on it. Mm -hmm. and, and we see now it's it's... It seems to be a risk factor. Um, all the studies, or most of the studies, are on handball players that we will see the association. Mm -hmm. And the latest one from from Denmark, from Mary de Miller, showed really, really nicely how scapular dyskinesis interact with with spiking the workload. So, it what they showed is like it doesn't matter what you. Shoulder looks like if you spike the load too much, it, you're gonna get busted anyway. Right. And on the other hand, if you don't spike it, it could look really, really biomechanically like really messy. Right. But if you don't spike your load, you you're able to adapt to that. Yeah. And on the other hand, we don't know if we can really change the the scapular dyskinesia. If we can just fix that, if you do these exercises and we look at you six months later, it would in many cases look the same. Mm -hmm. But the pain will 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 be will, it won't be there anymore right so right. i tend not to focus on it it's more like okay we have a major scapular dyskinesia play could play a role but in the end i probably end up with pretty much the same exercises because it's got it yeah got so it. it's so it's 10 years ago i was i was like that was the main thing that i looked at like oh i measured it and like video film it and everything i show the player like look what's going on on the back of your children yeah but it's the more and more you work with it and and it's like many other things like you, you stop doing something and patient gets well anyway right. then it's like, oh, okay right. okay i could focus. probably focus on other things that might be more beneficial and the patient might actually have some buy-in with yeah Still not really convinced about the whole scapular dyskinesia. It's probably a thing in, in what we see in our handball players, but it doesn't really change that much. Mm -hmm. Like, if anything, it's could say, like, okay, you have this and you're weak in your shoulder, you really shouldn't spike your load from, from what we know from the evidence. So, now, yeah. is there anything that we've missed? Because if not, I have one more question for you. Okay, now I'm just gonna take a sip. Um, yeah, take a sip. Mull it over. Did we miss anything? Is there anything else about this that you really want therapists to know about when it comes to 
this kind of overworked overhead athlete. If a young, like a kid or youth player, if they have pain on the same specific pot, spot, like if they always point in this spot on the knee, on the shoulder, like mm -hmm. it's here and it goes on for several days or for a week and they, they try to relax and then they come back. Now it's the same spot, no same spot. If that happens for a week, like it's not, not like seven days, that's a magic number, but mm -hmm. say roughly for a week, it probably won't go away. What, what you're doing, just keeping on playing, it won't just go away. Mm -hmm. But if it's just something pops up, ah, oh, my, my, my hamstring feels a little bit, and the other day now it feels fine, and now it's like my lower back feels a little bit, it's probably something that comes with sport, and especially with the young players when they're not really, really used to do some heavy exercises the first mm -hmm. time they do something new. They get some muscle soreness, which comes with the, with the, with the, like a side effect or yeah, practice. it comes with the territory when you're playing um, yeah. competitive sports. I mean, we've yeah. all played competitive sports. I mean, yeah. I I was a softball pitcher for many years, and like I would pitch the next day, I would be my arm would be super sore. Yeah, but then by like Monday, like I played on a Saturday, by Monday it would be back to normal again. So I never really worried about that too much because it was just part of the game. Yeah. Yeah, so that's what I'm trying to tell, tell the, the parents or the coaches because everyone's like, oh, when, when should we seek care or not? Like if, if it goes on for a week and it's the same spot all the time, it's always pointing at the same spot. Like now it's still sore, it's still painful, it's still painful. Then I think that then you have to change your strategy. Then you can't just play on. Yeah, yeah. and I think that's sound advice. Yeah, I think it's, it's, it's just something that comes from experience. Mm -hmm. like, for sure. Because if you're going to seek medical care for everything that that's a little bit painful, if you into sport like like handball or yeah softball pitching or, or any other like sports that put a, like quite physical high high physical demand, mm -hmm. then then you then you won't do anything else than run to the clinic. Right, yeah. right, yeah, absolutely. Then then you have a, a constant rehabber. Yeah, yeah, which is not good. No. No, it's not good, and and that so, I'm sure has psychological carryover into many other areas of life. I don't know what that is. I'm not a psychiatrist, but I I can imagine it can't be good. I no, think, no, I think because, you become very fearful of movement, and no one. Yeah. you should never be fearful of movement, especially no. as a child. No, and and especially what we know nowadays around the pain and and everything that goes on, and I yeah. think this. This is the age when you're, you're really exploring pain and what it is. So it, I think it's like many other things in your life. It's, 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 you learn like, oh, this hurt like hell. Oh, it's because of this. And it, oh, it went away. It's nothing, it's nothing serious. It's nothing dangerous. So just, yeah, I think we should yeah. be careful on that side as well. We're going to wrap things up. But before we do... I ask everyone yep. the same question. Sorry, I didn't preface this to you beforehand, but no. that's okay. Um, so given where you are now in your life and in your career, what advice would you give yourself as a new grad? My first advice would be never be afraid to ask questions. Never be afraid to send an email or, or ask someone on Twitter. Or the, the worst thing that could happen is, is that they, they don't answer. That's, uh, I think, yeah, would be the worst thing. Yeah. yeah, if you never but ask the question, the answer is always no. Yeah, yeah. So, so uh, that's my major advice. And that's something that I learned through years. Like, ah, should I ask that? That's probably a dumb question. Or, or that person has done so much or, or whatever. Just, just keep asking questions. Yeah. That's, that's the major thing. And the other thing is, is be really, really humble of what you what you can especially when you're working in sports you're you're there for someone else it's yep. not for you uh if, if you gain something of it more than than just the happiness of of hopefully getting someone back on the pitch on the course uh that's that's bonus thing but you're there for someone else like someone put their literally their career in into your hands so so be humble with that yeah yeah that's the only thing and nice. yeah, and try to to watch other other people working. Just trying to ask if you can spend a day with them in the clinic because you learn so much. You learn so much of just just sitting there and watching. You don't even have to ask questions during the session. Just 
taking notes and what happened there and what just it's and it and it's that goes whether you're in like a new rookie or a new graduator or if you were working for 20 years just you always learn something new it's it's really 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 useful so and it goes with the, with the first one just send an email yeah. the worst one is like no i'm too busy or i don't i don't no i don't i don't i don't, I don't do, do that do, sorry i don't do that sorry but but at least I mean, just to know. But you got to try. Most of the people I know uh, would, are happy to do that. Yes, I agree. I agree. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for this. This was a great little mini master class. So where can people uh, find you if they have questions or they want to reach out to you? Where's the best way? I think the best way is through Twitter. Uh-huh. Uh, I've, I've, yeah, I think that the best way, email or, or through Twitter. Yeah. yeah, and we'll have your yeah. links to Twitter. Well, what's your Twitter handle? It's just at... Um, I think it's at think Martin it's Asker. At Martin Asker. I think it is, is too. It? I think so. Yeah, I think, I think so. so. Um, but at any Good. rate, just for all the people listening, we'll have a yeah. direct link in the show notes to your Twitter account and also to any resources that, we might, that you might have mentioned. If there's any studies that you want to send our way, yeah. we can put them all in the show notes so people can do one click and go right to it. So thank you so for much sure. for coming on. Ah, my pleasure. Thank you for having me, Kate. Yeah, it was great. Yeah. And everyone else, thanks so much for listening. Have a great couple of days and stay healthy, wealthy, and smart. Thank you for listening. And please subscribe to the podcast at podcast.healthywealthysmart.com. And don't forget to follow us on social media.